Hello there and welcome back to another video here on Wrist Watch Revival. My name is Marshall. Thank you so much for coming along. This time on the bench, we have a really cool watch. Look at this thing. It's called an Ernest Beal. And you may be wondering, I haven't heard of that brand before. What, what is an Ernest Beal watch? Well, I'm going to reveal that to you over the course of this. You can see this is a nice little gold watch from the late 50s, maybe early 60s. And this one came to me from David, who is a Patreon supporter of mine. And this watch was actually given to his grandfather upon his retirement. And his grandfather's name, Ernest Beal. <laughs> That's right. The company that he worked for, instead of engraving the back of the watch, which was very common for the time, had his name printed on the front, which I think is really cool. And I've never seen that before. This is the first watch I've ever seen where somebody decided to uh, to print somebody's name on the front of the dial. And they did a pretty decent job with it. And as you can see, the watch comes to me in pretty good shape. The case is a little beat up. It's a gold plated case. I'm going to use my spring tool here, my bolt action spring bar tool. I love this thing. I got it from a, a guy on Instagram um, a, called Hassler Instruments. He makes these in his shop at home and they're really cool. I mean, admittedly a little bit of overkill perhaps for a spring bar tool, but uh, the tools are part of the fun of this hobby. And uh, yeah, so let's see if the watch will wind up. Um, and it does, as you can see, it's actually running. And it was interesting because David uh, had thought that the watch was broken for about 25 years, but he got it out before sending it to me and he said it fired right back up for him, which uh, he was happy about. And he did mention this too, the crown comes off. <laughs> so it's not uh, tightly secured to the stem. You can see the stem sticking out there and the crown won't stay on it. So we'll need to address that as well. But it was kind of cool. He had a bit of a moment, you know, he his grandfather died back in 1972. And he wore the watch a bunch, he said, after that, even though he was a kid when that happened. But um, he thought he overwound it and that it broke. But as you can see, as we put it on the time grapher here, it is actually still running, although really not very well. Uh, amplitude still, there it is, 142, so quite low. The rate's all over the place, beat airs out quite a bit. So this watch is definitely in need of a service at the very least. And that's probably why he thought it wasn't working. It probably just needed a service and uh, stopped working as a result. And take a look at the movement. Yeah, it's sticking right along. One telltale sign that this is an older movement, again, from probably the late 50s, is the balance bridge has a, a jewel on the top that is not shock protected. It doesn't have any type of spring or anything to protect the watch in the event that it were to be dropped. That was something that they invented a little bit after this watch's time. In the 60s, they really came into, like every watch had it. Every watch today does as well. It just gives you an extra layer of insurance if you drop your watch, because you know, that does happen. Okay, let's take the bezel off of the front here. You can see the crystal's a little banged up, but not too bad. We'll probably just replace it. It does have a crack on it. The tile looks great. And still, I'm just kind of blown away that they actually went to the trouble of having a custom dial made for his grandpa. He must have done a heck of a job at whatever uh, whatever his career was because they, they wanted to send him off in style, and boy, did they. A watch with your name on it, <laughs> on the dial. <laughs> Pretty crazy. Okay, we can remove the hands. Another telltale sign that this is an older watch is the Seconds hand, you see it's down at the bottom there next to the six o'clock marker. It's not a center seconds. You know, most watches these days have a big seconds hand that goes around the middle where the other two hands are. But back in the day, uh, it was much more common to have the watches with the uh, center seconds down at the bottom or sometimes off to the side. It's a little easier to make the movement that way. Okay, you can remove the dial now. And I've got the little case to protect it as well. I wanna be especially careful with this dial because it's in very good shape. And I don't know what kind of quality the printing of the name actually is, like what kind of ink they used or process that they used on it. And so I just wanna be careful not to, to damage that. Okay, now I can put the crown and the stem back into place. It's, I screwed the crown back on. It's just sort of held tight, but not too tight. And now we can let down the mainspring. You can see in order to do this, I just have to move the little click off to the side and then the mainspring will just unwind on its own. Now I can start by taking the balance off. 
If you're new to my videos, by the way, I wanted to say welcome. I'm really glad you're here to go on a little watch restoration journey. I know that uh, a lot of people have told me that when they watch the videos, it it kind of takes them out of real life for a little while. And I like that. I, I like it that it's just me and you here. We got a watch to restore. The rest of the world can wait. We'll start by taking off the upper bridges here. This is called the train wheel bridge. Looking at the movement, by the way, I don't recognize the brand. Looks like it says Luvik or Lauvik. But movement wise, this looks like a pretty straightforward movement, perhaps even one from one of the off the shelf brands. The most famous of which, uh, which is still around today, by the way, is called ETA, or some people just call it ETA. And what they do is they're a company that makes just the movement parts of the watch, but complete movements. And they're very, very, very reliable, very robust, very popular. And they shell, they sell them off the shelf. So if you're a watch company, maybe you work with a manufacturer to make a case that you really like and the dial and the hands but you need a movement to run your watch and you know developing a movement from scratch is extraordinarily expensive so instead you would buy an ETA movement off the shelf and in fact many uh, big name watch companies that you will recognize do this even today it makes sense and it was certainly the way of the world back then as well the swiss watchmaking world this this is a swiss watch um, was based around that principle where everything was specialized, but also all in Switzerland. Now it's more spread out. Okay, I can take the click, uh, the click screw out, which will allow me to take out the click spring and the click itself. A click is just a ratchet. You know, a, a device that allows like a wheel or something to turn in one direction, but not turn back the other. That's all it is. And like the spring I'm taking out is just the tension for that ratcheting action. It's really pretty simple. It's kind of interesting. The, when you actually get into the inside part of the watch, each individual interaction between two watch parts is, is actually simple, uh, generally. It's only when you zoom out that it gets <laughs> kind of dauntingly complicated. But like we can use this watch as a good example. I can show you how the train of wheels works and what the basics are for how that, that works pretty well on a, on a simple movement like this. I just have to take off this uh, barrel bridge and that'll reveal the train of wheels underneath. And if you take a look at the top, that's the barrel bridge that has the mainspring in it. Then it goes to the center wheel, third wheel, fourth wheel, escape wheel, pallet fork, and then that transfers power to where the balance goes, which I've already taken out in this case. It's kind of like, I view it kind of like a waterfall. The power from that mainspring kind of falls down the waterfall. And each time it goes from one wheel to the next, it's changing the gear ratios dramatically, right? And that's, that's what those wheels are there for. The interesting thing is the goal of this whole mechanism is actually to slow down that unwinding of a mainspring and to slow it down in a very specific regimented manner so that it will uh, unwind at a very specific uh, rate. In this case, this watch is likely 18,000 times per hour. Okay, almost done uh, disassembling the the movement here as well. We still have to turn it over and take off the rest, but this is a fairly straightforward movement. But do you see how that pallet fork is stuck in the jewel? Th that is an indication that this movement needs to be serviced. And that is, of course, where we're going to start here as well. As we noted, the movement was actually running, and it was kind of funny because David uh, wrote me a letter when he sent this to me. And he mentioned, he said he had a kind of a moment with the watch because he thought it had been not running for 25 years. But when he took it out of the drawer to send it to me, he had said it, it, it miraculously started running again. You know, and he just said, I took a moment to kind of reflect on life and think about the ups and downs of his life and, you know, all the things that we go through day to day uh, during life. And he kind of found it poetic that both he and the watch were still ticking.
which I really like that. Watches can serve um, as interesting reminders day to day. They, they, of course, tell the time, and they are actually quite convenient for that. I know a lot of people think, well, I got a cell phone. What do I need that for? And, and that is true to a point. I mean, if all you need to do is be able to tell the time, your phone will do that. But I will say that watches add a couple of other dimensions to it. One, there is a practical dimension, which is that it's just easier to look at your wrist than it is to reach into your pocket and pull out a big old phone. But also, you know, there's a historical element to these. There's an artistic element to these that is mostly missing on, on you know, cellular uh, modern cell phones and stuff like that. They're, they're kind of homogenous at this point. And even though they can be very well made, you know, the variety that you get from these watches is quite different. But they also uh, serve a little, a more like kind of, I don't know how to put it, but uh, less practical uh, meaning, which is that, you know, th they do show the passage of time and that can be very motivational, I think, right? It can be a little reminder like, hey, you know, you only get so much of this stuff. Make sure you use it right. Looks like the uh, setting lever's stuck. But I think, oh yeah, see, those should just come out. And the fact that it doesn't means that it has a lot of dried on oil. And uh, this thing really is going to need a good cleaning, I think. Let's take a look at the mainspring here. Um, David had thought that perhaps he had overwound the watch, which is kind of hard to do, but it is possible. You can, you can wind, 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 and then just like push too hard and it, and it can cause some damage, but it doesn't look like that's the case here. Um, I think the watch just desperately needed a service. I'll probably replace this mainspring anyway, just because if it hasn't been serviced in a long time, it probably could use one though. I will say this mainspring looks fine. Okay, now what we're doing here from a big picture perspective is we're gonna completely disassemble this watch, which we just did. And now we're gonna put it in these little mesh baskets into a bigger mesh basket and then into the watch cleaning machine. And that is going to allow us to uh, thoroughly clean this movement with a specialized solutions that are made exactly for that purpose. They'll dissolve any dirt, grime, and baked on, cooked on, dried up oil on there and they will uh, get this movement back into good shape. Now, the other thing we have to look at here though is the case. Okay, so first what I'm gonna do is just give it a quick cleaning with some pegwood just to kind of see what we're looking at here. But here's the thing. This case is plated. It's plated in gold, meaning that it's very likely brass as what they call the base metal, the underneath part. And then they will use an electro process called plate, you know, electro, something, I don't actually know what it's called, but electroplating, yeah, uh, to, to put a thin, thin layer of gold on top of it um, so that it has that gold finish and that gold look. And the question that we have to do, that we have to look at is how do we wanna handle this case? Because when a watch case is plated, it is very risky business to polish it, to sand it, to do anything to it, because the plating can be so thin that you can just take it right off. So. Let's take a look at that in a minute, but for now, it's time for the watch cleaning machine. And as you can see, it's got three jars. There's those two on the side, and then there's one in the back that you can just sort of barely see. And they each have a cleaning solution in them. This is actually the main cleaning solution right here. And then there's two rinses, and then that last little kind of pillar on the left there is actually just a drying chamber to get all of any of the fluid evaporated. So there you go. The watch is now in the watch cleaning machine. And while it cleans up, I did want to say thank you to each and every one of you who support me on Patreon. I have a Patreon for this channel. It's patreon.com slash wristwatch revival. And basically it's the way that you can give back to the content creators that make stuff that you really love. If they help out with your day, if you just get a lot of enjoyment on it and you want to keep seeing more of it, Patreon's a great way to do it and I have one for this channel. If you do sign up, you get a thank you card and a wristwatch revival sticker in the mail, no matter what level you sign up for. And uh, there's a few levels, you get some cool perks, some early looks at some of the videos, that kind of stuff. And now that the watch is out of the watch cleaning machine, take a look at that. It looks so much better. Uh, you can see how it had gotten a bit discolored and stuff, and now it's all clean and sparkly. So before we get back to the movement though, take a look at the case. I had an email exchange with David and I told him, take a close look here. And what you'll see 
is that the plating's missing. Do you see how it's missing on that corner? The edges of it's gone. And, and do you see this dot right here? That's missing plating around the edges. And I mailed them and said, look, I can do nothing or I can do a light polish or we could even replate the whole thing. And he said, you know what? I actually wanna wear this. And he was open to the idea of replating it. And I said, let's do, let's do that. And that's what we're gonna do here. We are actually gonna do a full restore on this case and get it looking about as good as we possibly can, hopefully. And for this case, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hand sand this. So the goal that we need to do is take a close look here. Do you see where the gold plating ends and then it turns into like a shinier, brighter brass? I need to remove all of the gold plating off of this. We have to strip this down to the base metal, then polish or get the base metal looking exactly how we want it to look, kind of like that. <laughs> and then we have to go through the electroplating process to get it looking as good as possible. And the way I do that is with these sanding sticks, They there's eight of them and they go from the harshest up to the lightest. And this takes a few hours to do by hand, but I think it's worth it. Do you see how nice that looks? It's shiny. And it's interesting because it is brass. So when you polish it, it actually kind of looks almost gold, um, but it's not. Um, what ends up happening with it is it will tarnish very quickly and turn brown. So, you know, make no mistake, even though it looks kind of nice and shiny here, it does still need to have that uh, gold plating done to it if we're gonna do it right. So again, a few hours later, we're all done and we can set up our plating. Now this is a multi-step process, particularly for gold. So I have the uh, source of the electricity on the right there, and then I've got a heating plate with this little, looks like a pill, but it's like a little magnetic thing that spins around, and then a piece of metal uh, on the side called an anode that you attach the electricity to. Now this little post that I've got here is also made of metal that will conduct that electricity and it'll conduct the electricity into the case. So what I'm gonna do first is dip it into some distilled water to remove, I already put this through the uh, ultrasonic cleaner a bunch of times, but what we're gonna do first is called electro cleaning. And it's kind of like the opposite of electroplating. Instead of making stuff stick to the surface, look what happens. It actually has quite a reaction and this is gonna remove any last little bits of oil, debris, dirt, um, anything that's left on there because we need a perfectly clean surface before we actually go through and do the actual electroplating. Anything that is on that surface, microscopic or otherwise, when you do the plating will show up. I think some people think it's like painting where if it's a little rough, but you paint over it, it kind of fills in the, the cracks and you can't tell. It is not like that at all. Plating happens at a molecular level and it will show every scratch, every little tiny thing. So the next thing we need to do is plate it. But you might think, all right, it's time for the gold plating. No. So it turns out the gold plating actually adheres to nickel really, really well and it gives it kind of a bright, beautiful finish. So we're gonna do what's called a strike of nickel plating on this. So this is a totally separate way to do it with different voltages and a different solution. And that will make it so that there's a, at least enough of a, a layer of nickel on it so that the gold will stick to it better. So as you can see, the nickel plating solution is green. It takes much less voltage, by the way. And if you look, you'll see not a whole lot going on in there. You know, that sometimes you'll see some bubbles, but I did a bunch of experimentation and the, the key is actually to get the voltage low enough because when those bubbles start to form on the surface, they prevent the plating from sticking. And look at the different color here. See how it's turned completely that, that silverish, I mean, nickel color. Nickel has kind of a warm silver color is how I would describe it. And take a look, whole new watch. <laughs> we could actually leave it like this and it would be kind of interesting, but you know, I wanna keep it the same style that it was when David's grandfather got it. So that means we need to get out this is the gold plating solution. It actually has gold dissolved into it. That's not really what happens, but that's a way that you can kind of conceptualize it. And now I can uh, attach the other side of the electricity and you can see the plating action in happening there. And that pill that's spinning on the bottom, that's helping keep the bubbles from forming on the surface of the workpiece. Okay, after this is sat in for about half an hour, 20 minutes or so, you can get a little sneak peek there. It's definitely gold. This is again, more um, 
distilled water to rinse it and take a look at what we have now, a fully replated case. And wow, that looks really good. A nice deep gold color on it. No more spots, no more wear points or anything like that. I can give it another quick polish. Again, you can't go crazy with it, but a quick one uh, to get it looking perfect as well. Now, the other thing is, is the crown and the crown is also gold plated and technically you can replate them, but they're very difficult to do because you have to get all of their original plating off and it's difficult to do so on the ridges on the side. So I'm just gonna replace the crown. So the first thing that we need to do when we're placing the crown, well, of course, is remove it. But then the next thing we need to do is figure out the size of the threads on this particular stem. Now, most of these are what they call a tap nine, which is 0.9 millimeter thread. Then I've got this gauge. And what you do is you just screw it in and see if that's the one that it fits in. And yep, it certainly is. So this is a tap nine. Most of them are, a few are a little bit one or one size below or above and check it out. I've got a crown that really looks exactly the same as the old one. I had that in a box of crowns and uh, looks good to me. It's brand new. And what I'm going to use here is a little bit of Loctite and this will prevent what happened before where the, the crown got loose on the thread and you could actually just unscrew the crown off of it because it had no tension at all. This is a type of adhesive that you can use that will keep the crown in place. It's not so strong that you can't undo it at some point, but it takes some force to do it. And it takes more force than would normally be put on the crown from winding. All right, and with that done, we can start the reassembly process for this movement. This is the new mainspring. This is what they look like when you buy them uh, brand new. You don't have to wind them in. You just get to simply place them in. This is actually, uh, a cool trick too. For people who are wanting to get into the hobby, one, one of the things that you'd really like to have is a set of mainspring winders, which you've probably seen me use on the channel a bunch of times. But I will say that if you aren't ready to spring for the for an, a very, very, very expensive tool like that, um, you can just replace the mainspring on each watch you use. And as long as you know how to measure it and find the new one, uh, you know, they're not that expensive and it's not a bad idea to replace the mainspring on watches that you're servicing anyway. And you get to install it like that. Now, if you screw it up and it comes out, you're, you're kind of, uh, in a bad spot, but yeah, it's at least a way to, to avoid having to buy the really expensive tools, at least up front. Okay. So now we can put the mainspring barrel back in place. I'll also put the setting lever screw in place and see how easy that went in before that was the one that I had to like almost pry out of there. And uh, things looking much better now that they've been cleaned up. Okay. Escape wheel, fourth wheel going in. This fourth wheel has what they call an extended pivot. Pivot is like the axle for the wheel. This one actually goes all the way through to the other side of the movement. And it's kind of interesting because that's actually what you put the seconds hand on to. You stick the seconds hand right onto that. It's kind of funny. Okay, center wheel in place. And you, this is another good look at the train of wheels and how they work. You can put the barrel bridge on as well. The barrel bridge has a hole for the uh, barrel itself. And then as you can see, it also has a jeweled hole for the center wheel. So we can secure that into place and that'll kind of give us a little bit of a stable base to work from before we put on the train wheel bridge, which is this. And as you can see, this one has three separate holes on the top, all jeweled. And the pivots from each of those wheels has to fit perfectly in both these jeweled holes on the top and then also the ones on the bottom. But I think we may have gotten lucky here Let's give it a quick test. It looks like it fell into place. No, nope, not quite. Although it's close. What is it? Oh, I see. It's just not quite getting around that screw hole, but is it still engaged? Yes, it is. There we go. Yeah, it looks like it's just a bit of a tight fit, but as long as the train wheel bridge is running freely, that means we are all set to, uh, to screw it down and into place.
And I can use a little bit of medium viscosity oil here on the barrel where it meets up with that uh, bridge that we just put on. You know, that is a friction point. Now it's a very slow one. That barrel unwinds very, very slowly, but over time it can certainly get worn. It's also under a fair bit of torque. So a little bit of uh, lubricant's a good thing there. Okay, click spring can go into place. Make sure it's seated properly. And the click. I love working on little movements like this. These things are great. Very straightforward. Careful with this one. Yeah, there we go. And now we can continue with the rebuild on the top. So that's the ratchet wheel. Again, that's what interacts with the click itself so that when you wind up your watch, it doesn't just unwind all at once. <laughs> Be a frustrating experience to say the least. And this is the crown wheel. This movement actually cleaned up really nicely. Like, it's kind of a pretty movement for, you know, for what's ultimately a, a workhorse is what you would call this, you know, kind of a day-to-day a -day workhorse movement. But um, this one's pretty. These screws are very, very small. And it's helpful to help to try to get them kind of lined up because you have to use this little tiny screwdriver for them as well. There we go. And a little bit of Rotico just to kind of clean things up. Occasionally, you know, you can get just some smudges or something like that on there. And Rotico is like a kind of like silly putty. If you've ever played with silly putty when you were a kid, it's kind of like that. And it just helps to pick up any little smudges or anything like that. And it's also good for picking up if you have a little bit of extra oil. You try to avoid that, right? Like, you know, usually you're trying to use a small enough amount that you don't have extra that's kind of not best practices, shall we say, to use too much oil. But it does happen sometimes, especially for people like me who are, you know, doing this at home as a hobby and stuff. And a, a little bit of Rotico can help clean it up nicely. Okay, now we're putting together what we call the keyless works. and the brand new crown on the stem as well. Make sure that everything's all lined up with this. There it goes. And that means that we can put on the setting lever itself. This is a little bit of a tricky operation because the screw for that is actually from the other side. So I've got to kind of pick up the movement while holding the setting lever in place. And then I can screw it down just like that. It's a little bit of a balancing act. Now we can do some oiling here because each of these posts needs a little bit of oil. Some of them need the grease, some of them need the medium viscosity oil. And I'm just gonna kind of knock out a bunch of these at once. And then I can just continue with the reassembly. So we'll go ahead and put on the cannon pinion now. And this is an intermediate wheel that's uh, used for setting the time, setting the hands. 
And this part's called the yoke. This movement has a kind of an interesting setup where the yoke springs actually kind of far away and it presses down on it from a high angle. Normally you'll see that spring aligned with the yoke so that it's kind of up against it. But this one has this weird setup where it comes in from the opposite side and only presses on the very end. I don't know why I've never seen that on another watch, but it seems effective. I, I Probably not the most robust way to do it, but it works. Now we can put the setting lever spring into place. This also acts as kind of a cover plate for a bunch of these parts so that things aren't shifting around or flying off. But as you can see, we have to engage the spring before fully tightening it down. Now I can use some of this blue grease that I like to use on these high viscosity parts. And that, I mean, it serves multiple purposes, but the two main ones are that it makes it work better, right? Because it's lubricated, so it's not as hard to like pull and push on the stem. And then also it'll help it last longer as well. And I, as you can see, I made a little bit of mess here with the grease, so I'm gonna use some Rotico once again to clean that up. And a quick test says, yep, that looks like it's working just fine. Very nice. And that means we can flip the movement back over and see if uh, it'll start to run again. Now, it was running before, although not particularly well. So the expectation is that yes, it will run. But you can't help when you work on these things to have a little bit of tension on this part. There's a little bit of, okay, let's, uh, let's hope I did this all right and it, and it kicks back up again. And then of course there's a question of how well will it run? Because it was running very, very poorly before. Okay, so we can get this uh, pallet fork bridge secured. And once we've done that, we can grab the uh, balance and we can see if this thing's gonna kick up again. And then if so, how well is it gonna run? Always like to make sure that we, oh, hey, oh, wait. It stopped. Hmm. Well, it wants to go. Hmm. You know, every time I've seen it happen like this, it's because something was touching it. Like the balance wheel was actually being obstructed or something like that. I'm going to use some air. Yeah, it's not even moving. So I, we need to take it. There's something going on here, but it feels, yeah, see, look at that. It actually starts to run a little bit once the Balance bridge is loosened, so it's very, very close. My guess is that it has something to do with the pallet fork or the pallet fork bridge. So I'm just gonna take that off, that part right there. See, do you see how it went down just a little bit? I think it's just not fully seated correctly. So I'm gonna take it off and put it back on and make sure that it's 100% flush and seated flat, and then we'll try this again. Because that being up just a little bit can just lightly rub on the balance wheel and it doesn't take much to stop the balance wheel. Really, it doesn't take much at all. So let's try it again. We have to get everything engaged properly. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, it stopped again. Okay. There we go. Now it's running how it should. See, no hesitation there. There's no stopping. There's no rubbing. There's nothing. It's just cranking right along. And that is exactly what we were hoping to see here after having completed this re uh, reassembly. That said, it's not completely done. That just lets us know, okay, the watch is running again. There's no major system malfunctions, but we still need to do the lubrication on this watch. So that we're gonna start with the uh, the jewels here, just a little tiny bit of lubrication on each one. But as you can see, this one is actually capped. And as you can see, this one doesn't have that spring that I can take off. So it's a lot more extensive to service the jewel there, but it's what has to be done. So we'll start off with the escape wheel jewel. And as you can see, there's a cap jewel that's held on by a little tiny screw. And that screw is tiny by the way <laughs> and so what we do is 
we'll take that cap jewel, put it in some, uh, it's called one dip. It's like a solvent. It'll help clean it. And just to make sure that it's all the way clean as well, I'll take a piece of peg wood and manually just clean that jewel just in case there's any extra little gunk or anything going on in there. And then we can just give it another quick rinse in the solvent. And then what we need to do is put a drop of oil onto that jewel. And this is a little bit of a tricky process because the oil needs to stay on the jewel itself. So let's see, there we go. And now we need to replace that whole thing on top without smashing it into a bunch of other stuff and spreading that oil everywhere, just like that. That is what we wanna do, perfect. And now I can very carefully replace this screw again as well. It's such a touchy subject because this screw is absolutely tiny. So I try to get it as seated as I can and then screw it down. It is incredible. I mean, that screwdriver that I used, I think it's half a millimeter is the size. I think it's 0.5. Yeah, it's 0.5 millimeters for that screwdriver. I mean, it's absolutely minuscule. So as you can see, I had to let down the mainspring again here because in order for us to properly service the rest of this movement, we actually need to go ahead and take apart the balance. And this is a bit of a pain, no doubt about it. But this is how it was on old school watches and this is just the way that you need to do it. So what needs to happen here is the balance comes off and then we need to disassemble the balance itself. Now that process in and of itself is a little tricky because of the size of the screws, how small they are and how difficult they can be to get at. But it's compounded by the fact that this work is being done right next to the hairspring, otherwise known as the balance spring. And that's that coiled spring in the middle. And that thing is super fragile. So I'm just gonna set aside the balance with its spring on there. One slip of the screwdriver on that and it will 100% bend it, you can even break it. And it's a major problem, the watch won't run. So it makes for very stressful work, um, this part of it, because you're just always worried that you're gonna slip and damage that, that hairspring. But thankfully, once that wheel's off of there, that uh, risk is reduced by a lot. And once again, we're dealing with these absolutely tiny screws. That's the same screwdriver I was using before, the 0.5 millimeter one. And as you can see, after that screw comes out, all the parts come away. So there's this cap jewel, the jewel setting, then there's the regulation arm, and then the, the balance with the spring and the, um, and the collet and all that. So same process here that we did before though, we need to fully clean this thing. So I'm gonna put both parts uh, into this solvent to get any of that dried on oil out of there. This is a really important part of the process because that wheel spins back and forth. Like I said, you know, literally thousands of times per hour, 18,000 times in this case. And so, it is a high friction point and you really, really need to make sure that that gets oiled properly or the watch will run way worse and for not as long. So this is the super tricky part. I put a dot of oil on the underside of that jewel, but the issue is that I need to get this whole entire balance bridge arm sitting on top of it so that I can screw that down. So what I'm gonna do is use a little bit of Rotico to kind of seat these parts so that they're not just sliding around on the bench and messing up the oil. And then I can carefully screw together these two parts using these little tiny screws. I mean, this is, th this is routine work for repairing and servicing these type of watches, but it, it is incredible to me how much more difficult this is than the modern process with the shock springs. It's riskier, it's more difficult. Let's just say I'm glad that we've moved on past uh, having no shock springs because this is always very stressful. Okay, with that done, now we can replace this balance wheel, but that stud on the right-hand side there needs to go in to where the stud screw is. Here, no, not quite. 
there like that. And then I can use this screwdriver to screw it back in. And then I can reset the regulation arm. And now finally, I can put this balance back into the watch and boom, it fires right back up again. So that's definitely what you want to see after having done all this uh, kind of specific work. And look at that beautiful things just flying. Let's put it on the time grapher and see how it does after some regulation. Hey, that is pretty good. One second a day is absolutely fantastic. The amplitude is good and high. The beat error is a little higher than I'd want, but given the risk that it takes to fix that on a watch like this, I'm not going to do it. I'm gonna leave it at 2.9. If it gets up higher, I probably would have to get in there, but you have to do some very risky work and it's there's not a huge payoff for that work. So I'm gonna leave it. And that means that we can continue with the restoration. Having this watch run much, much better than it did before. It's actually keeping really good time even after all these years, really awesome. Get a good look at that dial there as well. How cool is that? Have you ever seen that before? I, <laughs> I didn't even know you could get that done. Okay, a little quick cleanup on the dial and uh, get it secured and that means that we can now put the hands on. So there's the hour hand going into place. I've got this hand press tool that I actually got as a Christmas gift a couple years ago. I love this thing. It makes putting on the hands uh, a lot easier. And one of the best features about it is that the, the little pusher is clear. And I thought at first, like whatever, it's just the plastic they use, but it's actually so that you can see what's going on, see underneath there so that you can get everything lined up. And I thought that's a really nice touch for this product. Okay, so that looks good. We do need to put the second hand back on there at the bottom. Again, that's going onto the fourth wheel pinion. And as you can see, the watch is running just fine. And we'll just give this a little nudge. You don't need to go crazy to put this part on. Okay, almost finished up. Now we can case this up and finally get a look of, at how everything's gonna look with the new plating and running beautifully. One thing we need to do, of course, though, is replace this crystal. So. That should be easy. The old crystal was in pretty good shape structurally, but it did have a deep scratch or maybe even a crack on the front. So it's definitely uh, fine to just replace the crystal in circumstances like that. We've got the bezel snugly fit around the crystal and then I can simply unwind it. And now we've got the bezel already, as well as the watch itself. And I can use some, uh, some air to make sure that there's no dust or debris and start to get a test fit here on the bezel. It looks really good. Okay, now there's these case screws that hold the movement to the case itself. And we'll need to replace those. Those make it so that the movement is nice and flush and also so that it's not knocking around, right? That, that's a good way to cause damage on a watch like this. And taking a quick look though, huh, look at the crown. It's actually sticking out too far. And I know why, I just didn't notice it before. But remember we replaced the crown and it has a slightly different design. And so what that means is we're gonna need to take off the crown. And as if you look, you can see that I can take it off no problem even with that Loctite on there by just using finger strength. And uh, we need to trim down this crown so that it sits flush with the case. Now it only needs a little bit. So I'm gonna use this file to make, just to take off the tiniest bit. I mean, if I had to guess, it would be like uh, less than a millimeter that we need to take off. So I don't wanna go with the end cutters and start clipping off big chunks of the end of this thing. It's more of a process of file it down, put the crown back on, replace it, see how it looks, a little bit more, no problem. And you kind of just go back and forth. It usually takes maybe four or five times to be able to get it right. And that's about what it took this time as well. And there we go. That looks much better with the crown, nice and flush with the case, not sticking out the side like that. As you can see, the back is actually made of stainless steel. That's really common on plated watches. And look at this beauty. 
I'm even going to put a new strap on it for David. I want him to wear this watch. You know, this might not be the everyday wear watch. It is a little bit delicate given that it has no shock protection and, you know, that kind of stuff. But you could definitely wear this a lot. And I want him to. So I'm going to put this strap on here for him as a, as a little encouragement to uh, put this watch on and get out there and wear it. And look how beautiful this thing came out. Fresh plating. The dial looks great. It's got his grandfather's name on it, and it's even running really well to boot. What a fun restoration. Thank you so much for joining me for it. Um, if you want to find me on Instagram, I'm wristwatch underscore revival under, over there. Would love it if you come by and say hi and check out my posts. Otherwise, thank you so much for hanging out. We'll see you next time.